It is so good to be with you today as we gather for this chapel service. I invite you to take your Bibles and open to Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 5. We're going to be looking at a story here. Uh, it's actually a, a true story, a, an event that happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. And we're going to begin to read in verse 17. I must say that it is always a privilege to be here at this university. It is an honor to partner with what TMU stands for and for what this institution stands for, what the faculty of this institution stands for. So it is a privilege and an honor to worship with you here in this chapel service. Luke's Gospel, chapter number five, beginning in verse number 17. You follow along with me as I read aloud. This is the word of the living God, and it reads as follows. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they were and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. And I'm preaching on the subject, the man who claimed to be God. If you would join me in prayer. Father, we do ask now your blessings on our time and your word. We ask that you would strengthen us and encourage us, equip us and help us. And we pray that you would raise up from this room faithful men and women who would not only take the faith seriously, but would live out their faith in the eyes of a godless culture and would refuse to give up, would refuse to give one inch to this present evil age, but that they would persevere in the faith. And now we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. You might remember the name if you have heard this name before, David Koresh. He was the leader of a group, a cult group years ago, and before there was a reality show in Waco, Texas, and a thing called the Magnolia Market, there was a cult that uh, met there in Waco, Texas, and this man, David Koresh, he claimed to be God. He claimed to be God, and, and as, he le as he led this cult, obviously we see as we read the story that he was responsible for the deaths of some 75 people in a standoff with the FBI. If you go throughout history, you will hear other stories, and you will learn of other individuals like Jim Jones, who himself claimed to be God. And he was responsible for the Jonestown Massacre in 1978, where a total of 918 people died because they followed Jim Jones. Many people throughout history have made the audacious claim to be God. In fact, there was an individual named 
Alexandra Barnes, who on April 24th, 2013 in Daytona Beach, Florida, drove her vehicle in to the gas pump, took the gas pump and doused her entire vehicle with gasoline, walked into the store, reached behind the counter, grabbed a lighter and made her way back out into the parking lot, the store clerk ran after her, tackled her to the ground, and she was successfully able to escape, and then she lit the gasoline and her car erupted into flames. The authorities were called. The scene was chaotic. She was screaming that her babies were in the car, an onlooker ran to the aid of her babies in the car, only to discover that they were her dogs. They pulled the dogs from the flaming vehicle. She was on her knees in the middle of the interstate when the authorities arrived, claiming to be God. Time and time and time throughout history, people make these sorts of claims. They claim to be God. They claim to be God and that people should listen to them. And one of the things that you will learn as you grow is that Every mainline cult has one central teaching that is common among them. As they overlap in these various different points, here's the point that brings all of these mainline cults together. It's this, that they reject the deity of Jesus Christ. Islam rejects that Jesus is God. Mormonism rejects the truth that Jesus is God. The Jehovah's Witnesses will reject the claim that Jesus is God. And you must just ask yourself this honest question, why is it that crazy people will actually say that they are God? And then why is it that mainline cults will join together in a force, if you will, to attack the very deity of Jesus? One of the things that you're going to have to settle early on in your Christian walk is this central reality that Jesus actually not only claimed to be God, but is presently God, has always been God, and will never cease to be God. The Nicene Creed says the following, that Jesus is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father of whom all things were made. I want us to examine this story here, this scene, if you will, in Jesus' earthly ministry, and I want us to see a couple of very important things. First of all, I want us to see that Jesus taught the Scriptures. He held to the authority and the, and the sufficiency of God's Word, but also what you will notice in this scene is that Jesus also taught through extraordinary events, miracles, and signs, and wonders accompanied Jesus' earthly ministry. Give your attention now to verse 17 and notice that Jesus taught the scriptures. It says that Jesus was there. What was he doing there? He was teaching. If you look at verse number 17, it says, on, on one of those days as he was teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Jesus was teaching. If you go to Mark's account of this very scene, Mark says that he was preaching. The idea is that Jesus was standing there in a posture of authority. He was standing there declaring the word of God. Teaching and preaching, although distinct, they overlap, and Jesus was the greatest teacher and the greatest preacher that the world has ever seen. Jesus is standing there in the presence of these, these people, this great crowd, and he's teaching the word. Jesus taught the scriptures. What you must understand is that you can have confidence in the word of God. The word of God preached to you, the word of God taught to you, and that you yourself should go out and teach the very word of God. Stand upon the authority and the sufficiency of God's word. Jesus stood upon the Word of God. He had confidence in the Word of God. 
The 1689 London Baptist Confession in Article 1, Paragraph 4 on the Scripture states the following, The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed depends not on the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, its author, who is truth itself. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the Word of God. The Bible is under assault in our culture. We see it all around us, do we not? Time and time and time again, we hear voice after voice after voice and opinion after opinion in our culture, whether it be in the sphere of politics or whether it be in the sphere of the academy, it seems that everyone is attacking the very word of God. I remember my time on the university campus. I was a student at the the University of West Georgia, and I remember one of my early classes walking in that first semester into a large lecture hall with several hundred students in this theater style lecture hall and and the professor walking out introducing himself and then immediately engaging in attacks upon the veracity and the sufficiency and the reliability of God's word so much so that I started looking at my syllabus to see if I was in the wrong class. He would ask questions and he would ask for students to raise their hand. If you're a Christian, raise your hand and hands would go up over the room and then he would start asking them pointed questions like, do you really believe that the things that are written in this book, this book that you say that you believe, do you really believe that that a large fish swallowed a disobedient preacher and then spit him out on a beach? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that your God created everything that is in the great expanse of the universe, created everything out of nothing? Do you really believe that? He would point at the students and ask. And then you could see that The pressure was mounting in the room as the unbelievers were chuckling and laughing at the student body, those who claimed to be Christians. Do you really believe that this Jesus walked up to the side of a tomb and then cried out, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man actually was raised from the dead? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus, who claimed to be the son of the living God, was put to death on a Roman cross and then buried in a tomb and on the third day was raised from the dead. Do you really believe that? And I thought I was there to learn about Western civilization. And the professor was mocking Christianity and he was mocking the very authority of God's word. What you must understand today is that you are given a privilege to study at this institution that has a high view of scripture, but that is not normal across America. So you should, you should cherish this opportunity that's given to you, but you should also challenge yourself to be very much aware of the fact that there is a a God-hating civilization and a God-hating world all around you that when you leave this campus and you go out into the workplace or you go out into the culture, they will mock you. They will challenge the very authority and sufficiency of God's word. Politicians will do it. Presidents will do it. Professors will do it. Friends and family, and family members may do it. But what you must see is that as we look at this text, we see that Jesus himself held to the authority of Scripture. He was teaching the Word of God. If you go all throughout the New Testament in Jesus' earthly ministry, we see that Jesus actually believed the Bible. When he was being attacked by the Sadducees on the very doctrine of the resurrection, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 22, he responds and says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus spoke back to the individuals that attacked him as he stood on the very word of God and he challenged them and he told them, no, you actually are ignorant. You yourselves have not known the scripture. When he was being attacked by Satan in the wilderness in his earthly ministry, 
time and time and time again, how did Jesus respond? Did he respond with doubt? No, he responded and he, he was quoting consistently, as it is written, and then he would quote the scripture. He would quote the scripture. Jesus quoted Jonah as an illustration of his own death, burial, and resurrection in Matthew chapter number 12. When they were asking for a sign to be given, this is what he said. He says, uh, well, they were saying to him, teacher, we would wish to see a sign from you. And he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you see, time and time again, Jesus, when asked questions or they, they set a trap for Jesus, he would drive them to the Word of God. He would teach them the Word of God. He quoted extensively from the Psalms. Even in his dying moment, he is quoting from the Psalms. Needless to say, Jesus believed the Bible. He believed the Old Testament scriptures that he would have been teaching at this very moment. And that's exactly what we must do as well in life, whether it be in discipleship of children or whether it be in the workplace or whether it be in vocational ministry as some of you will be called to preach the word you must stand without blushing upon the word of the living God second of all in this text in verses 17 and following down to verse number 26 not only did Jesus teach and not only did he stand upon the reliability of scripture but he also taught through miracles he would use miracles to demonstrate that he, in fact, is God. Notice the scene. If you look at this text and you see at the end of verse number 17, you see the, the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And then you notice the scene. It says that there were some men who were bringing on a bed this man who was paralyzed. And they were, they were seeking to get this man to Jesus because, you see, Jesus' popularity had been growing extensively. As Jesus in his earthly ministry was going from city and town and village to village, he was preaching and he was performing miracles. And the word was spreading rapidly about Jesus, so much so that people wanted to just flock to hear the man preach and to see what he might do. And there were so many people in this house that the, the crowd was overflowing and spilling outside of the doors of this house where Jesus was gathered in verse number 19, you see the word crowd. If you go back to verse number 1 of chapter 5, you see the word crowd. And again, it's repeated in verse number 16. The point is, is that wherever Jesus went, there were crowds gathered because he was preaching the word and he was performing miracles and signs and wonders and people could not explain it. And as his popularity grew, everyone wanted to come and see for themselves. These friends were here with this man that was paralyzed and they wanted to get him into the very presence of Jesus. The Pharisees were there. Uh, again, the Pharisees were, were individuals who were the teachers of the law. They were the, the elites, if you will, in the religious community of, of, of Israel, of the Jewish people. And unlike the Sadducees who did not believe in miracles, the Pharisees did believe in miracles. They did believe and embrace the resurrection of the dead. They did believe in an afterlife. They did believe and embrace what they considered to be the sovereignty of God. They were monotheistic, and they also claimed to believe in the doctrine of predestination. They seemed to be rather orthodox. But as time would progress, their zeal for the law would cause them to build a great fence around God's law and then add things to God's law so as to pervert it. The teachers of the law here referenced in verse number 17, uh, we see they are the scribes, the scribes. And notice in verse number 18 and following, the scene unfolds with with these individuals who were bringing this man on a bed, paralyzed there, could not move. And Jesus 
notices their faith. You see the word faith in verse number 20. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Interestingly enough, these individuals are bringing their friend to Jesus. They had heard of Jesus' power to heal. They had heard about the miracles. They had heard about the signs and wonders. And they knew that their friend was in a very desperate state and a, a massive need. And so they flocked to where they heard that Jesus was with the man carrying him on this bed. They wanted him to be in the very presence of Jesus. They saw and felt that Jesus was their hope. They were determined. They acted with urgency. We can learn a lot from this in this, in this scene. Jesus points out their faith, not just talking about the man on the bed, but also the friends, the whole group. And because they could not get inside, notice what happens there. If you, if you look, it says in verse number 19, finding no way to bring him in because of the great crowd, they went up on top of the house. Now, in this culture, the, the rooftops would have been flat, and they would not have had the, the pitched roof like we see in our culture today. And the tile, the clay tiles, they would start to take apart and create this hole big enough to let a man down on this bed. And interestingly enough, as you see Jesus respond in verse number 20, you don't see Jesus talking about the fact that, you know, these guys are just disrupting everything. No, and in fact, he, he points out that they had great faith. And as the whole scene unfolds, as the man comes down on this bed in front of everyone in the crowd, you can just picture everyone looking over the top, trying to stand up, trying to get a glimpse, trying to see what was happening. They could hear the commotion. The teaching had now come to a standstill. The man comes down on this bed in front of Jesus. And everyone is starting, you can just feel the intensity you can just imagine being in that very room, especially if you had traveled from great distances because you were curious as to great miracles and signs and wonders. Yeah, okay, he's teaching the word. Okay, when's he going to do something that's extraordinary? When's he going to do something that's really going to be powerful? When is a miracle going to take place? And suddenly the moment happened. He stops teaching. It's quiet in the room except for the commotion of the, the roof being taken apart from, from on top of the house. And now here comes this bed down with this paralyzed man and his friends there trying to get the man in the very presence of Jesus. And now you can just imagine with the intensity growing to a fever pitch. They're thinking, okay, here it is. Here, here's the great moment. Here's the moment where we're going to get to see it for ourselves. Now, you've got to remember, this is a primitive time. There was no TikTok. There was no internet. There was no social media. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was no opportunity to spread the, the miracles around by just the snap of a phone and then sending it out with a couple of hashtags so that everyone could see it. No, it was by word of mouth. They would talk about it in their village and then friends would spread it to another village and they would spread around and suddenly everyone's traveling to see this man named Jesus. At that very moment, they're thinking, here it is. And Jesus does the unthinkable. Jesus does something that's very strange. Instead of continuing to teach, he stopped. And instead of saying what they thought at that very moment when Jesus started to speak, he's going to say, stand up and walk, rise up and walk. But Jesus doesn't do that. He does something that is very unique. In fact, he does the unthinkable. He actually says, man, your sins are forgiven. But you can just imagine at that very moment, first of all, you have a response from the people in the room with a great fever pitch of intensity or wanting to see a miracle. And now Jesus just looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven you. Well, that's not really extraordinary. But then the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the scribes that were sitting perhaps on the very front row in a place of honor and prestige are standing there at the front watching, they're offended they're offended. In fact, they even started to reason within themselves. They started to question. 
You see this controversy. Now, as, as they were there, you, you just notice in the, in the text here, it says, uh, when this happens, they started to, to question Jesus inwardly, accusing him of blasphemy. How dare this man actually say, your sins are forgiven you? Because only God can do that. And they were actually correct about that. If you go all the way back through the Old Testament scriptures, you see in the scene with the Lord coming before Moses on the mountainside in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. This is Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. It goes on and says much more about himself, but the fact is, this is what the Lord was proclaiming about himself to Moses, that he is the God who forgives sin. In Nehemiah chapter 9, when you have Israel standing and confessing and then reading the law for a quarter of the day, just reading the law of God, they're reading testimonies about Israel, and they get to a place where they learn about their forefathers, that they refuse to obey, and then it says this, but you are a God ready to forgive gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. So in Exodus 34, we see God is the God who forgives sin. In Nehemiah chapter 9, we see the, the testimony that God is a God who is gracious and merciful and forgives sin. In the Psalms, in Psalm 103 verse 12, we learn that our God forgives our sin and he removes our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. In Isaiah 55 verse 7, we see that our God will abundantly pardon. The point is, is that our God is a God who forgives. God is the one who possesses the authority to forgive sins. Who is it that would have the, the audacious desire to stand in a posture of authority and dare say to a man, your sins be forgiven you? But that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what happened. And we live in a culture that hates that very truth. In recent days, my Twitter account has been hijacked by many trolls who, it doesn't matter what I say, they come after me with vicious, vile hatred. So I was in Brazil recently with a staff member and I was preaching there and on our travels back, I said, you know what, I'm just going to test. When I get home tomorrow, I'm just going to tweet out something simple like, Jesus is God. And then just see what their response is. And so I did, and it was unbelievable. They just went bananas. It's a simple tweet. Three words filled with absolute truth, and the godless culture hates it. In this very scene, as, as this crowd was interested in seeing a miracle done, Jesus does the unthinkable and says, your sins are forgiven you. What is he doing? This is what Jesus was doing. Mark it down. Jesus was, was making it abundantly clear. He is claiming to be God. That's what he was doing. And all throughout the scriptures, we see that Jesus makes these claims to be God. If you go back to Exodus you have the Lord speaking to Moses and telling Moses to go before his people and to command them to follow. And he was a bit nervous. And so he asked, he said, well, when I go and I stand before the people and I speak these words to them, they're going to ask me who sent you and then I'm going to have to give them an answer. And so this is how the Lord responded. He said, you tell them that I am that I am has sent you. The I am who spoke to Moses is the very God who protected Israel. The I am who spoke to Moses is the very God who shamed Egypt. The very I am who spoke to Moses is the one who parted the Red Sea. And he's the one who saved Israel alive. And so that very scene was passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation as 
the people of God would disciple their families to learn about who God is. And then you come to the New Testament and you see that time and time and time again, Jesus in his earthly ministry would make powerful statements such as in John chapter number eight where he would say, before Abraham was, I am. Or in John chapter six, I am the bread of life. Or in John chapter eight, I am the light of the world. Or in John chapter 10, I am the door to the sheep. Or in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. Or in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. Or in John 15, I am the true vine. Time and time and time again, Jesus would make these statements claiming to be God. But in this scene, he doesn't use that same exact phrase. But what he does when he says, your sins are forgiven, he is claiming to possess the authority of God. It is one thing to perf perform some sort of miracle. They could, they could try to explain that away. But when Jesus possessed the authority to actually forgive sin, he stepped across the line according to the Pharisees and the scribes. But Jesus proved his deity further. If you look in your text here, you'll see in verse number 22 when they questioned him and they asked questions like, how in the world is this possible? Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Notice how Jesus responds in verse 22. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Why do you question in your hearts? Now they're standing there furious, these Pharisees and scribes. They're furious with Jesus. And then Jesus looks at them and starts speaking the things that they're thinking in their mind, in their heart. They're making accusations against Jesus without a spoken word, and he reads their minds and then speaks to them and confronts them. This is just another means by which Jesus was proving his deity right in their very presence. And then the scene turns. In verse number 24, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man, speaking of himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise and pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Jesus proved his, his deity. He proved the fact that he is indeed not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, not just a prophet, but he in fact is God. Very God of very God. Light of light. One with the Father. God in human flesh. It was a massive miracle. It was in fact a double miracle. The first miracle was that he forgave the man's sins. The second miracle was a physical miracle that illustrated what happened in the first miracle. And both served to prove the fact that Jesus is God. This is powerful. This is, this is an unbelievable scene. And you can imagine the scene now with the house there. Many scholars believe that this might have actually been Peter's home. It's just filled with all of these people who are just seeing this whole thing play out right before them. And when this happens, when Jesus not only, not only speaks with authority and, a, and the posture of deity and says to the man that his sins are forgiven, but then speaks back to the actual teachers of the law, the guardians of the law, the Pharisees, and shuts their mouths they were brought to a standstill, the whole room. You, you could have cut the tension with a knife. It was so thick. It says, and amazement seized them all. Amazement. How do we use the word awesome or that was amazing? We just kind of throw these words around and they don't really have the, the weight 
If you think about how we use words like that, just this week, my, my family's with me. We arrived here Monday morning. We took our rental car. We went out through the coast. We went out to Malibu, spent the day at the beach, walked around, looked at cars. My son and I have, a, have a, an affection for like really nice cars. And so we're looking at all these cars. We spotted a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, all these cars. And then we, we walked on the beach and at every turn, the cars were amazing. The sand was amazing. The weather in Southern California is amazing. The food we ate was amazing. There's a lobster roll there at the end of the, the pier in Malibu that I highly recommend. It was amazing. And we use that language. It's so common to us. But this specific word that's being used here, amazement, means to be struck with profound astonishment, to be just speechless, astonished at what had just happened. Like they could not speak, their, their lips would not move. They're silent. It says that they were seized. Martin Lloyd Jones, a great preacher from church history, made this statement. He said, If you do not believe in the unique deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not a Christian, whatever else you may be. If you're in this room today and you think that you're a Christian but you reject the deity of Christ, you're not a Christian, whatever else you may be. You may possess good morals, you may be an upstanding individual in the sense of what the world says is right and good, but if you reject that Jesus is God, you can't be a Christian. That's why it's so important to understand when you're dealing with these other false religions. Like when Islam wants to throw a bone to Jesus and say that Jesus is a, a gifted teacher or a gifted prophet or something of that nature. If you have these false religions that want to talk like that about Jesus, like the, the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses do, what you have to recognize is that if Jesus claimed to be God, and he did not do this just one time, he did it numerous times, and he wasn't truly God, then he should not be a man that's celebrated as a gifted teacher. He should be rejected as a crazy false prophet to be avoided. So you can't have it both ways. And that's the contradiction of these false religions that will say that Jesus was this or he was that or he was this, this, this angelic being or that he was a gifted rabbi or whatever it might be. You can't have it both ways. Either he is Lord God and you must bow before him, submit your entire life to him and follow after him, or he's a crazy man and you should reject him. And if you reject the deity of Christ, you cannot be a Christian. In this very scene, they were smitten with amazement, seized with astonishment, and they responded in glorifying God. The believers responded in glorifying God saying we have seen extraordinary things today. I'll leave you with this. I want you to remember that what we see played out in this very scene is extraordinary because Christianity is extraordinary. The very God that we are learning about in this text of Scripture did not just come into being at the beginning of the New Testament, at the end of Malachi, in the beginning of Matthew. This very God has always been, and he created the entire world, and right now he holds your very next breath, and he orders the universe, and every star and every planet is ordered by him, and he is indeed very God, a very God. I want to urge you to think critically about Christ, and I want you to remember that Jesus is not just any teacher or any man, but he in fact is the God 
the God that deserves worship. BBC interviewed in the UK, they interviewed leading historians years ago and asked the question, who is the greatest leader that has impacted world history? And they, as they interviewed these historians, they asked this question and then they provided all of the answers and they, they numbered them according to the answers. It was striking, the results. As you look at the results, you see individuals like an African freedom fighter or Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln made the top five and Queen Elizabeth made the top five. But Jesus was nowhere close to the top of the list. Not even close. We live in a world that wants to throw a bone to Jesus at Christmas. They want to unpack him right like the day after Thanksgiving, take him out of the attic, decorate their living rooms, and then right about New Year's, pack Jesus back away until the fall. That's the world that we live in. That's the best case scenario of our God-hating culture. And what you need to recognize is that Jesus can't be packed away in an attic space. Jesus is God, and the unique deity of Christ must be embraced as we follow after Christ. So I want to encourage you today, young men and young women in this room, you're going to go out into this world and you're going to be challenged. The very truth of this Bible is going to be challenged before you, and the reality of who Jesus is is going to be challenged before you. And I want to encourage you to not give up. Don't throw in the white towel. Don't give one inch to this God-hating world that surrounds you. Be steadfast in the faith, and always remember that, that Christ is king, and one of these days, he's going to return. And the whole world shall know that on that very day that he is indeed very God of very God. And every knee shall bow before him. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So remain steadfast in the faith. Don't give up. Don't shut up. Don't back up. And always remember that Jesus is king. Jesus is not just a great teacher from world history. Jesus is is indeed God. And if you're in this room today and you're not truly saved, I know that I'm preaching in chapel at a very respected evangelical Christian university. But as I stand before you, I know personally from firsthand experience what it's like to sit under the preaching of the word as an unconverted young man. I grew up in the church, made a profession of faith when I was a young boy, was baptized as a follower of Jesus, but I sat under sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, and I wasn't a Christian until I was 25. I'd graduated college, and I'm working at my desk at work, and I was listening to a sermon on the internet when the Lord saved me. I want you to know that it is quite probable that in this room today that I am addressing some of you who are not yet saved. I want to urge you even under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this very one in this very text today, not only did he do that, but he went further in his earthly ministry and he went to a cross and he died in a substitutionary death and he was buried in a tomb. And then this is the validation, the crowning proof of his deity was that he himself was raised from the dead on the third day. Christ is coming. Life is short. And Jesus is God. And I would urge you, if you're in this room as an unbeliever, that you would cast yourself upon the mercy of God, that you would cry out for salvation for any and all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To the Christians in this room, remain steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. May God bless you.